um, if you've been to these conversations previously, you'll know that uh, the best way to attract my attention is to um, toss a question in there or, or just say that you want to ask a question and one or two of you have uh, written questions down in, in advance. So um, I think the way we'll do this is uh, I'll talk to Jeremy um, for uh, 20 minutes or so, but, but please, if, if, he, if he says something that, that you find particularly pertinent to what you want to talk about, please uh, charge in. Um, I can see from the, the list of names there that there are lots of people who know much more about science than I do, so um, uh, I'm, I'm expecting you to uh, charge in uh, as well. So, uh, Jeremy, thank you for making time for this. Uh, where, whereabouts are you at the moment? You're, 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 you're muted, Jeremy. There's always one, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm about a kilometre up the road from you in Summertown. Oh, right. OK. You, you have a very good bookcase, um, <laughs> which is always important on, uh, for these occasions. Um, to, to, can you just describe what your past couple of months has been like? Uh, yeah, it goes, it goes actually back to um, uh, New Year's Eve. Um, uh, actually, when I, I got a call from a, an old friend, uh, actually, originally did his uh, PhD in Oxford actually who's now the head of China CDC um, and actually we worked together many years ago on SARS and uh, he phoned me up on New Year's Eve to say that there was a series of, um, uh, of people with a slightly odd lung infection in a city in China but that they did not think this was the coming back of SARS and uh, and it's really been sort of relentless since then really um, and of course watching it you know spread across China and then of course the whole world over the last over the first hundred days is uh, something that we will um, people will be talking about for another hundred years and uh, certainly something that none of us have ever experienced in our lives so um, we're going through extraordinary times. Let's backtrack a bit because um, although when we first spoke about you coming to do this talk which as we were saying was about a year ago that was because of your work with Welcome but in fact, this this field of epidemiology is your field. Um, and uh, can you talk a bit about the kind of work that you were doing and whether this particular kind of virus was was on your radar? Because I, I know you you did a lot on SARS, you did a lot on flu, you did a lot on H one N one. But but just talk a bit about how your background has prepared you for this moment. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, in truth, I, even even sort of my background, I suppose, doesn't really prepare for what you're, what we're going through at the moment, but um, perhaps come back to that uh, later. But yeah, so I, I, um, I went, uh, I, I was born in Asia, I was born in Singapore, but um, came, to, came to the UK when I was a teenager, um, having lived all around the world with a a family of uh, youngest of six and a, and a father that was an English teacher and um, came back from uh, Tripoli, Libya in when I was at, um, to do A-levels and, and then went to university. But um, after a whole, after a sort of medical career in Edinburgh and Oxford, um, I then went to Vietnam thinking I'd go for two or three years, to be honest, and come back to, to the NHS. I uh, stayed 18 years living in Vietnam from, what, 1995 to 2013. And uh, was doing a lot of work on malaria and TB, HIV, things uh, important in Vietnam at the time. But then um, uh, again, on New Year's Eve, actually, of um, Vietnamese New Year, um, we, uh, we started to see cases that subsequently proved to be SARS and then bird flu. And from that, which was about 2002, I suppose my, my own research career and clinical career moved into emerging infections. And, and so um, SARS, MER, uh, subsequently MERS and Ebola, of course, and all of the others in between. And to be honest, when I came back to the UK in 2013, I thought that sort of era of my career was over. Um, but actually, if you look back in the last six years since I've been back in the UK and you just look through Middle East, uh, MERS in the Middle East, Ebola in West Africa, Ebola now in DRC, Zika, uh, the pandemic, uh, the pandemic um, and of course now with SARS-2, um, it's as if uh, this has continued to haunt us in a way. So it's it's just uh, odd that you've brought this back at the same time that you're now uh, head of welcome. Yeah. Can you can you talk generally because we we might drill down into the specifics, but about the relationship between science and 
policy. Um, and uh, I'm really interested in, in what you think science is able to do in a, in a crisis like this. What are the limitations of the science? And I, I know if you go back to H1N1 um, and the, the various articles that have been written about, about how some of the predictions around that were wildly wrong. Um, and uh, and that led to a sort of undermining of faith in science and what scientists could do. But can you just talk a bit about, about the, the limits of science and the limits of modeling? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, so one of the great, the great challenges is, is, is science on the whole, or, or at least the, the life sciences. But and, and to, and when I say science, I, I'm actually really meaning uh, everything, including social science, anthropology, uh, behavioral science, and others, and of course they all have very different perspectives, and that that's a very positive thing and a different way of addressing how they try and answer questions. But but essentially, it has a scientific method to it that you ask a question and you then try and formulate a hypothesis and a way of testing it, and then you do the test and and then you refine the question and you go forward. When you're dealing with these uh, events like now. Um, one of the greatest challenges is you're just dealing with total uncertainty. Uh, and the uncertainty is obviously greater at the start, and you hope, you hope, gets less as you go forward. But, but what it can't give you, and science can't give you this, it can't give you this now, um, four months into this epidemic, is certainty about where we are and where we're going. And that is incredibly difficult for many people to handle. And on a personal level, I've actually always really enjoyed working in uncertainty because I think it's a really interesting uh, place to be. And, but, it, but it it does not suit everybody. And then when you come to put science and the humility of uncertainty with policy, which frankly has to be, you would hope at least, um, some degree of black and white, and you actually have to make decisions, that is a very almost unholy alliance in some ways, um, because you can't just base policy on hard science, particularly when that science is uncertain, and yet you can't wait until the science is certain in order to make policy. And in that gray zone between, that unholy alliance, uh, you've got some really tough things to do. And, and uh, you know, coming into this now, and I've been transparent about it, ser serving on the SAGE Committee of Advice into Government, and then seeing how that advice is either taken or not, and then uh, try to inform policy. That's a very, very complex and difficult relationship, which I, you know, I'm honest about. I think makes you feel at times very, very uncomfortable. And can you talk a bit about the sort of third leg of it, which is the the communication of of, of the science as well? So you're you're having um, conversations with with advisors and with politicians, but but then there's a huge piece of this which is trying to uh talk about very complex science in in very blunt and easily understood terms and there's lots of people who at the moment feel really quite confused yeah and and uh, you know i'm sure of all people you would agree with this and i and i think um this is this has not happened yet i hope it will happen in the coming days or, or weeks at, at most it seems to me that the crucial element of that is transparency um, everybody accepts that you're going to make, especially in a period like we're going through today, you're going to make mistakes. Um, uh, that's inevitable, I'm afraid. You're trying to make the fewest mistakes you can, and you're trying to make the, the smallest number of mistakes that have the biggest impact and avoid the really bad outcomes. Uh, but you'll get a lot of those things wrong. And the ability to respond and adapt and be agile about that's really important. But through that, uh, despite what you describe as the, com the, which is true, the complexity, I think at the heart of it is transparency. Um, at the end of the day, this is the governed and the governing. You know, during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, this was absolutely brought to the fore, but it's happening in the UK and Europe now. Is, is, is people may not like what you're saying, but at least if they can see how you're making those decisions and you're honest about it and you're honest enough to say we got it wrong, then I think transparency is, is the way forward. And I think unfortunately over the last few weeks and months, there hasn't always been sufficient, there isn't now, sufficient transparency about why certain difficult decisions are made uh, and, and, and without really people understanding how those decisions were reached. I, I wonder what the problem is there. I, I was, uh, you, you may have read this, but Lawrence Friedman's um, magisterial 52 page instant history of, of, of this virus, which um, 
I think he published yesterday, um, goes back to 2011 and talks about the SAGE group over H1N1 and, and how even in 2011, a parliamentary committee was criticizing the fact that there was no transparency around SAGE. And yet here we are nearly 10 years later with the same discussion. What, 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 what do you think stands between uh, transparency uh, and, and, and politics? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, to be honest, experienced enough in order to be able to answer that. I think a lot of it's driven by fear. Um, a lot of it, I think, is driven by um, uh, still not, a, not an appreciation that transparency is actually a route to better decision making. Um, I think it's not clear that by being transparent, uh, you can be, you, you'll be more trusted, um, even when you get it wrong. Um, but, and I think that you know, you're right to draw those lessons. Um, uh, it was true during foot and mouth disease as well, actually, um, and during the pandemic. Uh, and, and take the pandemic, 2009. I was in Mexico in, in May of 2009, which is about three weeks after that, uh, that pandemic started. And I would, I would defend, if defend is the right word, when I went in Mexico in May 2009, in a square kilometre of central Mexico, there are four hospitals around the central square. Every one was full of young people on a ventilator. If you looked at that situation then, your only logical thing was to say, this is going to be horrible. Now, in due course, it proved that that actually proved not to be true. But if you had not made that decision then, you would not have had... Uh, the capacity to increase fac um, uh, flu vaccine uptake and declare a pandemic and all the rest of things. And, and as long as you were transparent about that and say, well, actually, yes, the decisions then had to change, I think a great deal of, of uh, respect can be had for that. The, the current situation, I think, is, and this is true across government, um, is that the default is secret and then occasionally be transparent. And I think that has to be flipped on its head to say the default is transparency unless there's a, re there's a really good reason not to be. And in truth, the number of reasons where that's true, certainly during this pandemic, is you could count on one hand. Um, but I think that's a difficult thing for civil servants and government to shift to. So you, you say you did this first got on your radar end, end, end of December, beginning of January. Um, and, and again, reading Lawrence Friedman's account, um, and of course, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but, but he, he pinpoints the, what, what evidently he thinks history will say is, was the slowness of various people, including the WHO to begin with, to appreciate the seriousness of, of it and, um, uh, and quotes various bits of, of scientific advice pinging around Whitehall right into early March with people saying this wasn't a very transmissible disease. Um, can you talk about that period between January and, and early March where it, it looks as though all kind of distinguished people hadn't really quite picked up on, um, on how this was a, a really vicious virus? Yeah, I, I, um, in another role, I, I, I chair the WHO um, Research and Development uh, Blueprint, which is the group in WHO that brings all of the global sort of uh, research stuff together. And, and, and so just to declare sort of, if you like that conflict. Um, so, um, and, and where to start? Um, the two things happened in January that I was very involved in. One was uh, the release by the Chinese authorities of the sequence of the virus. Um, and uh, that did have to be pushed. It wasn't naturally just gonna happen. And um, perhaps not right to say, but involved in uh, through that contact to China CDC, I mentioned of encouraging that virus sequence to be released. That was absolutely critical um, because without it, uh, nobody could make a diagnostic test, and indeed nobody could start making vaccines. So, so that was critical, and China did that under under quite a lot of um, personal and other pressure. And that was very important. The second thing that that spent a lot of January doing was working with some really good people scientifically that do stuff that I can't do, uh, working out where the virus came from. Uh, aware of the fact that anything coming out of China in the current US-China relations was going to be an absolutely massive, tense political issue. And working out um, that that virus, in all probability, came from a natural reservoir evolved and came across 
across into the human species. That was another piece of work. But it was clear by the end of January that not only was this an infection that had come from animals into humans, that it was capable of going from one person to another, human to human transmission, and that it had a clinical spectrum from very mild all the way through tragically to killing people. Now, if, if, you, were, if you were writing a book or a paper or teaching anybody, you know, those are the features that you would be terrified about and would keep you up at night. Plus, it's happening in a massive city of 11 million people with one of the most connected travel hubs in China. Now, just put all of that together and you've got a perfect storm. I think it was very clear at the end of January that this was going to be something of, of a global phenomenon. Um, and actually, if, if um, without, I'm not defending my own actions here, but if you go back to the stuff on the press releases and stuff and comments we've made since the end of January, I think it was, it was very, very clear that this was going to be an absolute, absolute uh, global phenomena. Uh, maybe not even as big, to be honest, as what it's proved to be, but this was going to be a huge event of global significance. And I think that was true and known at the end of January. So can you take us, you just give us a flavor of what it's like to be a, a scientist in, in, in the room with, with, with policymakers and, and, and politicians. Um, and the kind of, I mean, if you were just scientists meeting, talking together, I imagine you would, you would speak in a certain kind of sort of easy language uh, and using the jargon of science. But at what level do you have to speak in order to 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 make the science uh, understandable by the the people who are going to have to make the the, the, the the tough decisions? So so what what is um, I think really important, and again the opacity of this doesn't help. In fact, I mean again, Sage meets uh, currently twice a week. It's met uh, well more than that actually, but two formal meetings a week, and then ad hoc meetings on side of that, uh, currently, of course, by, by, by Zoom or, or whatever other, other technique. In that room are then, uh, I don't know, 40 or 50 people uh, fed information from about another 200 people who sit on subgroups of it, who are doing the sort of detailed work. Uh, and of that 40 or 50 people, there are probably, I don't know, about 10 of us that are outside government and independent and then a large group of civil servants from DFID, Department of Health, Education, whatever else it is. And then of course, and it's been controversial and it's been in the press, uh, uh, people from number 10 uh, and other ministries sitting in to observe. In, in, in my experience, and, and this is, I'm not making any comment here about my own political views, but, but I would say I, I actually wish that those policy advisors from government had attended more meetings. Um, because one of the challenges of SAGE, it is a scientific group that advises, and of course, um, rightly or wrongly, it doesn't make the decisions on policy, and there's a gap there. Uh, and, the, and the better that gap can be filled, so that advice is directly into policy, in my view, would be better, uh, because there's a lag phase in implementation between advice and the ability to pull the levers of policy that actually change things on the ground, whether it's access to PPE, hospital acquired infections, infection in the community care homes and whatever. And, and that lag phase in an epidemic, in normal working times, if you have a lag phase, it may not matter that much. But in an epidemic, if you have a lag phase of two weeks, it's a disaster. Because mm. uh, one of the things I've learned in every epidemic I've been involved in, if you get behind the curve at any, po any point, it's incredibly difficult to catch up with it at any later date. And, you know, I think that is the lesson that will be learned, of course, in some future inquiries and the rest of it, the, the crucial phase in the epidemic, in this epidemic, was the last week or so of January and the weeks of February. Um, as early as that. As early as that. And that's yeah. when the decisions, frankly, that were made in Germany, for instance, um, different epidemic, and we can talk about the differences, young people coming back from ski holidays in the Alps, etc. Where did the epidemic first start? German extra capacity on testing, a lot of differences. But nevertheless, the decisions you make uh, in those first few weeks of an epidemic are ultimately what defines the rest of the epidemic. And, and if you get behind the curve, or you, and I think at the end of January saying, um, uh, the, the decisions that are made in the next two or three weeks are absolutely critical to what happens to the subsequent epidemic. And, and actually the fact that those decisions, I think in retrospect, I think were not right, uh, frankly, 
uh, are why we've subsequently gone on to have an epidemic that, that uh, at least to some degree could have been avoided. So just, just from, from the outside and, and reading what's filtered through into the public domain, it, 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 it feels as though there was a, 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 an argument at some point in, in late January, early, uh, early February, in which this, this phrase, herd, herd immunity, was on the table. Um, is that right, that, 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 that herd immunity was a, was a kind of um, cul-de-sac that was preventing people uh, taking more decisive action? I, I don't... Uh, um, herd immunity is not a scientific strategy that has merit. Um, you, you can't accept... Uh, and, and actually, Patrick Valance is the chair of SAGE. I, I know he's been quoted in this newsreel about how he talked about herd immunity. I am not aware, and I would certainly have never have argued for, a concept of herd immunity which would mean naturally elect, elect letting a, what, was, what is a very, very nasty virus pass through a population and accept that there would be a very high uh, amount of illness and and people dying at the level it would have died at in order to protect the rest of the population. To me, as a public health and, and as a clinician, that's an unacceptable way uh, to think about public health. Um, I'm, I'm not in favour of, of herd immunity, which has to therefore inevitably, and a horrible word to use, sacrifice a certain number of the population in order to protect it. That is not public health. So, so I do not believe, I never believed, and I'm not going to believe in the future, the concept of herd immunity through natural infection, allowing to pass through a community. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not aware, I hate to say I've forgotten, I don't like that phrase. I'm not aware that that concept was ever discussed at SAGE in my presence, no. Right, okay. Um, so what, again, in, 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 in retrospect, because um, it's interesting that you say that the lack of urgency really was sort of felt much, much earlier in January, February time, whereas I suppose as a sort of lay reader of, of, of this narrative, you tend to think, well, it was, it was around about the time of the sort of Cheltenham race course, uh, the, the, the sort of some period between the 10th of March and the 26th of March that, that, that people were dragging their feet. But, but really you're saying that that was actually, those were, those were not the crucial discussions. I, I don't think they were. But going back to this phase, the, the critical thing in epidemics is to be decisive and, uh, and courageous because you're more likely to be blamed for overreacting. And, you know, frankly, in the last 20 years, whether it's SARS or pandemic, um, you know, there's been a lot of complaints about people overreacting. That's just the nature of public health. If, if you overreact, um, it will be criticised. If you underreact, uh, you'll be criticised. You, you just have to have a thick skin about that. But the worst thing to do is underreact. We learned that in West Africa and Ebola. Um, the initial phases, and Margaret Chan then as head of director general was very severely criticised, in my view rightly so, for underestimating Ebola in West Africa in 2014 and the epidemic took off. The, the lessons of that were not learned. And here again in January and February, um, partially because of comments actually you just sort of innocently made that, that you know, the modelling of 2009 pandemic got it so spectacularly wrong, or the modelling on BSE that said everyone was going to die, that left a sort of scar on the community, which I think led to some degree of underreacting to stuff. And, and again, as I say, if you underreacted at the end of January and through the month, the weeks of February, you're, you're behind the curve. And if there was, if I pointed at one difference, let's say between Korea, Germany and the UK, it would be that those critical five or six weeks are when Germany, for different reasons, reacted more boldly and more courageously, in my view, and Britain was slow to react. So, so, so again, help, help me as a, as a non-scientist, because those, those two, um, the, the two uh, previous uh, epidemics where where science is 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 now said to have got it wrong. They, they both came out of in, imperial and without personalizing it around the the, the people. I suppose a non scientist might say, well, what, why is imperial now in the driving seat in this one if they got it wrong in the past? Yeah, I, again, I think I, I, 
on again, I think that is a wrong caricature of of, of the way that things get reported. Um, I'm not blaming the media, um, but it, it, it's the reporting around the sort of iconic scientist, yeah. which we know is rubbish as a, as a concept. Um, Neil Ferguson, and again, I've known Neil for many, many years. Um, and of course, uh, he's been in the press quite often and his name is known and the rest of things. Uh, th there would probably be 50 or 60 modelers, epidemiologists working on this, uh, feeding into SAGE, of which Neil was a very eloquent and, and very uh, respected opinion, but it was only one of many. Um, Warwick, Manchester, London School of Hygiene, Edinburgh. I mean, the, the number of different models that fed into that was far more than, there was no single dominant model, whatever the, whatever the reporting um, ha, ha, has been. But again, coming back to modeling, modeling, you know, anybody that tries to predict the future in these uncertain, unstable, rapidly changing situations is doomed to fail. Uh, modeling doesn't really seek to predict the future. What it tries to do is to frame the future and say, these are the scenarios that could play out. And if we change this, open schools, close schools, uh, isolate, not isolate, uh, the virus changes, it doesn't change. What is likely to happen to the course of that epidemic? It, it, at its best, it is not, and it shouldn't be trying to predict the future because that's impossible. It's trying to provide a more rational, logical framework around which you can think and challenge. Um, and although it gets reported that, you know, BSE was going to kill hundreds of thousands of people in the UK, that's actually not what it did. What it said is, if the following, if the following things pan out, um, then these are the possible scenarios. To me, and I'm not a modeler, that seems an incredibly useful exercise because the alternative is just to shout who shouts loudest with their opinion. So you say it's not about predicting the future, but but um, there was a stark moment about a month ago, I think, where where you came out and said that you thought that you, that the UK was going to be the worst country in in Europe, um, and that turned out to be right. Yeah, but that's not rocket science. I mean, you know, you just had to look um, when that statement was made. And to be honest, I think it, you could have made it a few weeks before that just looked at the number of people who were in hospital in the UK and you knew how severe the disease was, you knew how many people were in intensive care and you knew that Britain was 60 million people, um, you know, uh, with a very, you know, unequal society, probably one of the more unequal societies in Britain. And we know, and a demographic that's relatively old uh, and a big care home population, you know, it's not rocket science to say that Britain is going to be very badly affected by this and the worst or one of the worst uh, countries in Europe. And, yeah, tragically, that is how it's panned out. So um, we'll, we'll stop looking back now. When, when you when you look forward now, and knowing that uh, Oxford is working their guts off to, to get a vaccine, but we don't yet know if that's going to work, is this something that you think, as a as a human species, we're just going to have to live with for for years? Yeah, I, th I think this is, it's an animal virus. It's the, it comes from a bat and it went through something between a bat and a human. But it, but the, it, that, and that's really important. We mustn't forget that because we've got to work out where it all came from. Um, but this is now a human infection. What, what we've seen, we witnessed and uh, uh, over the last uh, three or four months is the emergence of now a true brand new novel human infection. Um, you know, SARS was a new human infection, but it died away. HIV was the new human infection, probably from the 1930s or so. Uh, we're witnessing the emergence of a brand new human infection, which is now endemic in the human population and is not going to disappear. Um, this will now uh, be part of the infectious cycle that humanity has to, has to live with. And uh, we, we're either going to have to uh, completely change the way we live um, with some degree of physical distancing forever. And the current restrictions that, are, that we're all living through and struggling with, um, they do nothing to address the root cause. Uh, they reduce the peak of an epidemic. Uh, they protect and they do undoubtedly save a lot of lives uh, at huge social health, well-being and economic cost. Uh, but they're, they're a plaster over a problem uh, because as soon as you lift those restrictions, uh, things will bounce back. And I can't think of any biological or social reason why we won't face rebounds 
and second waves of this infection. So the only exit from this, if you like, is the production of interventions that actually totally reduce the risk of that. And ultimately, that means diagnostics and treatment and vaccines, as with most other infectious diseases. And then an appreciation of what society is going to look like uh, when, we, when we sort of come to emerge from this. So with your other hat on uh, of, of giving out a great deal of money as part of the Wellcome Trust, um, I think you, you were quoted recently saying you thought this was a kind of $8 billion question, that, 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 that it's, it, it's going to need an intervention, a scientific, scientific intervention of that order of magnitude. To, to get the vaccine and the, the tracking and the tracing and the things that genuinely can uh, deal with this? Yeah, so, so the world economy at the moment is losing about 350 to 400 billion US dollars a month. Um, the implications of that uh, for the medium term, after a period in the UK of, of 10 years of austerity, uh, they are massive. Uh, and the, the long-term economic consequences of this are only just being appreciated uh, at the moment. The, the highest unemployment rate in the United States since the Great Depression. Um, what is it, 60 or 70 percent of uh, Br the British workforce actually essentially being nationalized at the moment with salaries paid by central government. Um, the economic costs of this are profound and will probably last close to a generation. Um, what you would need to, to get us out of this, if you like, if treatments and vaccines are going to work, is, is yes, 8 billion is needed catalytically, and the European Commission played an absolutely fantastic role in bringing together the pledging conference, and we'll get close to that 8 billion. But that is the catalytic to get to a vaccine. If you then want to vaccinate 7 billion people or close to it, you're going to need much closer to 30 or 40 billion US dollars over the course of the next year or two to take a vaccine to vaccination and make sure that everybody in the world that gets that needs it, which is essentially everybody, uh, can get it free at the point of delivery, which is the underlying principle. Uh, but if you put $40 million against the probably 350 to 400 billion a month, it would probably be the greatest investment humanity had ever made. Uh, but that's what you're gonna need, because, you're, because you, you, all of that's gotta happen at risk. Normally what you'd do is you do the science, you'd, you'd stop, you'd think about it, you'd pause, you'd, you might then do the phase two testing, you might then build a factory to manufacture it, you'd then think how on earth are we going to distribute that. You haven't got the time to do that, so you've got to do it all at once, and you've got to think right the way through from start to finish. So although the Oxford group, you're right, done a fantastic job and they should, you know, they should deserve all credit they, they, they will, and I think that vaccine has a very good chance of working. But there's a glass shortage in the world at the moment. There isn't enough glass to put a vaccine into glass vials. Uh, there's a syringe shortage. So if we had to inject the vaccine, we wouldn't have enough syringes in the world. And then finally, you've got a horrible geopolitical um, structure of the world at the moment, uh, which means you're in grave danger of going into something akin to vaccine nationalism, where each country will have to look after itself uh, in enlightened stupidity, really, in, in national stupidity, really. Um, without thinking of the need to, to, to take a global perspective. So, so putting all that together politically and scientifically is a huge challenge. Um, I was, that, that was going to lead to my, my final question before I open this up. Um, so, so how worried, I was going to ask whether science and scientists are working differently in, in this crisis. And um, I, I think people think that the, the role of the CDC in America is less um, noble than it would have been in the past because it's been um, uh, disabled a bit by, by, by um, politicians. Uh, and you've got the United States withdrawing funding from the WHO. So at, at the time when, when the kind of intervention that is needed is, 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 is so urgent, lots of things are going wrong. Yeah, and, and they're not unlinked. <laughs> I mean, you know, though you get what you, I hate to say it, but you get what you vote for, and, and, uh, or you don't vote for, but, but those things are not linked. I mean, uh, you could imagine a different world where the tensions, yeah, between China and America were not as they were, uh, you, and you could imagine that would have had an impact in January and February already. Um, uh, 
And that's going to play out even more in the coming months. And of course, the US is going to go through an election in November and, and that will have, again, a profound impact on, uh, on, on global affairs. Um, if you're being an optimist, and, and we have to be in these circumstances, I, I would argue that, that if you look back in the last 100 years, and I'm obviously not a historian, the last 200 years, uh, occasionally the world faces these enormous crises, um, which are just totally discombobulating across the whole world in ways that are difficult to imagine. You might romanticize when you look back in history, but actually living through them are horrific. Um, when we come out of this, whatever that means, and I'm not quite sure how to get there yet, but when we do, the world will face another choice. Um, do, we, do we appreciate that whether you think about emerging infections, drug resistance, uh, the challenges of mental health, climate change, uh, uh, inequality, any of these real challenges of the 21st century. After this, are we going to go back to thinking nationalism can solve those problems? Or are we going to take a different tack and, you know, without being melodramatic, are we going to take an almost 1918-like approach? Or are we going to take a 1945-type approach? And, and I think it's as profound as that. And those of us living through this are going to face that choice. Um, and I think it, it will effectively define the 21st century. Wow. Well, look, um, I'm going to, the, the first two questions I'm going to take, I'm going to take one from um, uh, Alessandro, who's a biochemist student here. Um, so, so Alessandro, I know you, you sent me three very good questions, but I'm only going to allow you one. Uh, and uh, after Alessandro, if Judith McGregor, who's an alumna, can be ready. Um, but Alessandro, why don't you fire away with your first question? Yeah, sure. So the Oxford VMIC, the Vaccines Manufacturing Innovation Centre, was announced in 2018 to enable a rapid global response to emerging highly infectious epidemic pathogens and speed up the scaling of vaccine manufacture. So my question really is, given that it was acknowledged that there was this structural gap in the UK's ability to rapidly respond to such threats in terms of late stage vaccine development and also policy in terms of Operation Cygnus reports that have come out recently, would you agree that the UK government was significantly underprepared? If, if that was the only example, <laughs> absolutely. Um, in fact, it goes longer than 2018, to be honest. Um, the challenge, if I'm being charitable, because uh, it, it, it was an absolute mistake, um, uh, unmitigated, and we would be in a very different position if different decisions had been made there. The challenge of this though, and I, you know, my own bias is coming from emerging infections. The, the challenge of this is you're faced with choices to make where you allocate uh, money uh, to things that may happen, or you allocate things that are critical today. You know, effectively, do you buy yourself an insurance policy of a VMIC, a vaccine manufacturing plant for emerging infections, which you know, I argued very strongly for, or do you invest that money in trying to shore up a very challenged and um, stretched NHS. And that's a very difficult trade-off. And even though I, I think they made the wrong decision, I do accept that's a difficult, difficult trade-off. Um, uh, because in the end, in fact, you need both. But at coming, you know, you can't have everything. It is about difficult choices. I would have made a different choice, so, um, but, and, it, and we've come to regret that now. Um, but it is about trade-offs of difficult choices, uh, if I was being charitable to those that made those decisions. Thanks, Alessandra. Um, Judith, are you there? Yes, hi. Um, Jeremy, my question really is about um, the Global South, developing countries, and the sort of sense that perhaps about two, three weeks ago, there was tremendous concern this would really wreak havoc health-wise in many, many countries in, in the developing world. And to date, that doesn't seem to have been the case. And in fact, there have been some very good health um, reactions, including in South Africa, where I was until quite recently. Um, and perhaps it's going to be inevitably more of a poverty and economic crisis going forward because of the interconnectedness and the, um, the problems that there will be in, in terms of supply chains and commodities and so on. But could you say, you know, do you buy into that? Is it just that we haven't seen it yet? Is it something we don't know about the virus and the way it's going through? I'm interested in your sort of thoughts as to why we don't seem to have seen if you like, such a dramatic health crisis to date in the LMICs. Yeah, um, so I, 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 um, I think if you look in, in Rio, uh, in Sao Paulo at the moment, um, and Peru and Ecuador, uh, 
so middle and low, some low income countries there, uh, you're seeing the, the, you know, devastation of in particularly in informal settlements around major city centers where hygiene and density of population is such a big issue. Um, my own view is that actually Africa is, is not yet at the start of this epidemic. Uh, and that, uh, for a, a number of reasons, uh, population density, movement of people, um, diagnostic capacity, a younger population may partially protect, uh, and also potentially some degree of, uh, temperature and humidity and uh, uh, and other which may be uh, a positive impact in in parts of uh, Africa but but I would not be sanguine that the continent of Africa isn't still yet to go through what would be a devastating uh, health impact and and to put into then your context and the way I've always framed these epidemics is is at the center of the epidemic is a circle which is the virus itself and the consequences so you know, all the impact of the virus itself. Then there's a second circle, which is the rest of healthcare. Uh, during any of these epidemics, Ebola in West Africa or in DRC at the moment, the knock-on consequences of not having measles vaccination, not having safe maternal child health, not having mental health, uh, the number of people getting TB treatment is massively down. So there's a secondary health consequence. But there's a third circle, which is mistrust in government and uh, fear and the potential rise of, uh, of uh, politicians that offer simpler solutions. And then the outer ring is uh, international relations and the supply chains and things you, you talked about. So, so I, I, I'm not as sanguine as you are that either South Africa has managed to control this given how infectious the virus is, given how dense some of their population uh, centers are and how stretched their healthcare system is. I, I think it, it is not, it's too early to be sure what the impact in, in Africa is gonna be and in South Asia, indeed, in, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and Nepal. Uh, but I think what you're seeing in Central and South America is, I think, a harbinger of what we're going to see in Africa, uh, but just delayed. You just Thank you. So you, you wanted to come back in. I no, I was thinking... All right, so I should point out Judith was our ambassador in South Africa, so she, uh, she's she got some uh, knowledge of, of the situation there. Um, okay, so what about... Um, uh, Kelly um, Rochinski, who's um, uh, a key person in keeping the college solvent. Where are you, Kelly? Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Come in and ask your question. Uh, thanks, Alan. Um, I just wondered, um, it, it kind of follows on from a point you just uh, made there, Jeremy. Um, I just wondered what impact do you think COVID-19 will have on the funding for the prevention of um, other major diseases such as malaria, HIV and TB? And do you think an increase um, in deaths from, from these diseases can be prevented? Yeah, it's that, it's that second circle that I talk about, which is so profound. So, you know, in every single one of these, let, go, to, go to Ebola in West Africa, 11,000 people died of Ebola in West Africa over that two year period. Um, a huge number more died of malaria, TB and HIV. Uh, over and above those that would tragically normal die as a result of that epidemic because people don't want to go to hospitals, they don't want to go to clinics, a uh, number of healthcare workers died, uh, services dropped off um, and the rest of it. In, at the moment, uh, the normal uh, number of people coming for TB uh, screening and treatment uh, in, a, in, in at least half a dozen countries in sub-Saharan Africa has dropped off by more than 80%. Now the disease has not disappeared, so one assumes that 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 80% that are not coming for any screening or treatment are now spreading that disease in the community. And, and as a result, you're going to see uh, inevitably an upswing in, uh, in TB and probably HIV as a, as a direct result. The good news is that the, the global fund replenishment was last year uh, and that replenishment was successful. And so the global fund is continuing to play a critical role in TB, HIV, malaria uh, around the world. Gavi, Global Alliance for Vaccines uh, replenishment is this year hosted by the UK on I think the 4th of June. And it is absolutely critical that any money coming into COVID is not at the expense of money going into Gavi. Um, if Gavi's probably been one of the best investments the world's ever made, its 20th birthday is this year, it's absolutely critical that they are completely funded as normal and that money is not stolen for COVID for Gavi type work. In the long run, again, you have to be optimistic because if you're not, you shouldn't be in this 
um, sort of work. Um, in the end, I think this could be the catalyst, tragically, that, tell, that proves to people just how vulnerable we all are, that how small the world is, and unless we get real about uh, uh, investing in public health, uh, we're going to face these repeatedly because the 21st century is going to be the century of epidemic diseases. So we've got to invest in public health, we've got to invest in prevention, and we've got to invest in the research that allows us to address the issues of, yes, those three pandemics, but more beyond that. And, and that's what I go back to talking to Alan about, about how we're going to face a choice. What sort of world do we want for the future? Uh, and sometimes, tragically, you need a horrible crisis like this to focus people's minds. A very good question that's just come in from Brian e. Sheaves. Brian, are you there uh, about the communication of science? Yes, um, I am. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm interested in the communication of science and um, uh, I suppose whether it's possible to um, be totally transparent in communicating the science given uh, the complexity of the situation um, and how uncertain the situation is. Um, but also alongside that, the need for really clear and simple messages um, in terms of how we should behave as, as the general public. And, and just pause there, because Alexandra Janoska has just come in with a similar question. Alexandra, do you want to come in and, and just, it's, a, it's sort of a similar question. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, my question was, um, how do you think the communication between scientists and the government and media could be improved to find it, fight the infodemic, which is connected with COVID-19, so that there is no um, so many fake news, such as injecting bleach um, to fight virus, which can be potentially very dangerous because people without science background could uh, harm the self more than protect from the virus. Okay. Yeah. So, so on both of those, I, I, yeah, the, the question of transparency come comes up all the time in all sorts of different aspects i mean um on the whole I, I have to say i think it's overstated um you know you it is possible to take complex things and 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 turn them not into overly simplistic stuff which is patronizing or which undermines anything but to actually communicate and i actually think it is possible to communicate uncertainty. Um, we do live with aspects of uncertainty in the rest of our lives. We do you know, take out things like insurance. We do accept that strange things will happen and, and things we can't predict happens. I actually think uh, society is much better at handling uncertainty than, than is thought. And I think if you, again, if you look back over the last just 10, 20 years and, and think where has, honestly, where has transparency really led to problems? Uh, I don't think there are many, and the benefits massively outweigh that. Um, and on the issue of um, uh, yeah, injecting uh, um, whatever it was, Dettol or, or whatever it was, I appreciate that that is a risk, and there may well be people around the world, tragically, who go off and do that. But, but I think you know, we can't keep everyone happy, we can't get everyone right, we can't do the right things everywhere. Um, but I think most people would have looked at the vast majority of people would have looked at and said that is just so stupid um, that actually I'm going to vote in a different way come November. I mean, there is always hope in the world. Um, so I, so I, 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 I think I think we can communicate uncertainty, and I think I think it's difficult to argue against transparency, including the humility of saying you've got got it wrong um, with the best intentions. And what we're saying today may have to evolve and change because when facts change, you, the best thing to do is to change your advice and your guidance. Um, but I, I don't really see an argument for not sharing that information. Uh, if I may have a follow-up question then, on the other side of transparency, there was a recent Nature paper published about how to build COVID-19 in vitro, which was very simple and could possibly um, lead to some form of biohazard, for example, do you think? all of the research should be shared and it was open access as well widely so that people have all the information which is currently available or if there should be some limit in terms of risk caused by such publications yeah this is a great question it is a great question and it's a hugely live live uh, topic and it goes into the whole um, questions of gain of function studies um, uh, and the ability to to yes in a biological lab sort of make almost whatever you want again and again I've made this argument for, for years now 
Um, the alternative is to not allow that, and yet that would still go on. And it would go on in ways that was not obvious. Um, it would go on secretly, it would go on under the radar screen, uh, and it would go on, yes, it would, in laboratories around the world. So in, the real, I, in my view, I'm, I'm not in favor of that either, because I think in many ways that's more dangerous. What I would like to see is, is using, and I think this is increasingly possible, uh, technological advances so that actually you can trace what is happening to reagents, to vectors, to molecular biology stuff that gets used in order to do what you just described. And so that there is an ability, uh, as there is with the, the, nuclear, uh, the nuclear energy and indeed nuclear power, that allows you as a world, and this goes back to the question of are we going to come together in a world or, or break up, um, that allows you to actually track where things like nuclear material is going. And actually, I think we could in the future be able to do that biologically as well. And, and had a series, I've had a series of uh, conversations over the last three or four years, actually, with the major manufacturers of all that biological reagents and things to think through how we could use some sort of fingerprinting mechanism that would allow you to know where things were going and what they were being used for. Because uh, I think otherwise you force things underground and into the secret world, and that in many ways is more dangerous. Thank you. Arush, you've got a question about the Wellcome Trust's priorities in the, in the future. I, I, do you want to come in and ask that question? Hello, uh, my, my both institutions during my research, they were uh, funded by Wellcome Trust. So I was wondering how um, this pandemic would affect the um, future research, uh, future funding direction of Wellcome Trust. Is there any chance that you could see less funding in uh, brain sciences or um, other, other disciplines that COVID-19 related research? A lot of scientists listening in. <laughs> it's best to see how you're going to answer that question. Um, uh, to say that, just to start with by saying, I think it's going to have a, prof we're in a very privileged position um, for reasons I can talk about if you want, but it, this is going to have a profound impact on non-welcome, both government research funding and other charitable funding. Uh, I was talking to another major UK charity that funds a lot of research in the UK uh, recently, and because of the way they generate their money in order to fund science, um, they're going to. This is going to be very difficult for them. So, so I, I, I'm not overly optimistic that other parts of the sector are, are going to necessarily survive or be able to fund at current current rate. Um, for us, and, and this has been well trailed and, and it's available obviously on all our websites. Uh, when I came into Welcome seven years ago, the endowment which drives everything we do stood at 13.7 billion pounds. Uh, today, it's 27 billion. Uh, and that's in seven years. It's a remarkable change, uh, which has nothing to do with, with me, by the way, um, in terms of those decisions. But, but, but what that means, in my view, is that when you're an organization twice the size, you're not just an organization that's grown bigger, you're fundamentally a different organization. And you, you have to rethink what you're doing because it comes with a huge responsibility because of the scale you're at in a relatively small country called the UK. Uh, and so what we have decided, and this has been a huge amount of effort over the last few years, is actually um, maybe counterintuitively, but to focus rather than try and uh, do everything. Because I think in the end, focus uh, allows you to have greater impact. And what that's going to mean in the future is that we're completely committed to discovery science. And again, by discovery science, I mean biomedical science, the physical sciences, social sciences, humanities, history, history. Uh, as related to science and medicine. So the broad range of discovery, in other words, great people in good environments uh, coming to us with good ideas, discovery. And then we're gonna have three focused areas that we put our attention to and pull together both science policy, social sciences, the whole gambit that we think is gonna move a field forward. And those three are gonna be infections, uh, climate change and health, and mental health neuroscience. Uh, because I think those, for me, are the th three, they're not the only ones, but they're the three great challenges of the 21st century. And critically, they're the three great challenges, I think, of the next generation. Um, and so that's where our focus will be. And in those challenge areas, we will bring everything, policy, science, advocacy, campaigning, leverage, partnership with others, 
so that we achieve what we hope will be an outsized impact. Uh, but we are still committed to the discovery space uh, because we don't think the welcome itself will come up with all good ideas. I, I, I've got a uh, terrible journalistic habit, Jer Jeremy, of, of um, looking at my, my news new my breaking news as we go so um literally in the last minute the bma has thrown its weight behind the teaching unions opposing the government's push to reopen schools in england um have you been part of those discussions do you have a view about whether schools should be reopened uh i do i i think infection rates in the u well f firstly if you keep schools closed the disproportionate impact on society is massive um uh, single parents, uh, parents trying to look after young children. Um, tragically, in a country as rich as Britain, the number of children where school is the only refuge of a safe place, uh, the only place sometimes they get to eat, and the only place they may not be part of abuse at home or even violence, is shocking, actually. So school closures is a massive societal issue, uh, and nobody should underestimate that. In my view, um, the infection rates in the UK today are too high uh, and the famous R0 is too close to one and the number of new infections is too close, is too high, uh, in my view, at least today, to reopen schools. Will that be different in two weeks' time when half-term ends and schools are potentially opened? It might be. But if, you, if the question was, should we open schools today, my, my answer would be no. Uh, and I think it's going to have to change by, by the first week of June if we're going to reopen schools. Um, because although school children have not uh, suffered severe disease so much, apart from uh, a relatively small number of people with very severe disease and children, uh, we don't yet, we're not confident enough to know whether children are playing an important role in transmission. Um, but I do appreciate that if you close schools from March and you don't reopen them to September, you're taking a whole cohort of children uh, and that will be inequitable across the country because people uh, from, uh, from wealthy backgrounds will be able to provide better uh, home education than can children from less privileged backgrounds and that will add to the inequality in the country. So schools are an absolutely critical role but from an infection point of view, infection numbers would have to reduce significantly in my view from where they are today to make it safe to open schools. We've got a couple of tutors, um, and, and we're, we're we're coming to the close of the conversation. But but maybe we've got two or three more questions. So, uh, Helen Barr, do you want to come and ask that question about about Brexit? You, yeah. um, am I unmuted? Sorry, you're, you're unmuted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. This has just been um, so amazing. I just wondered, um, to what extent do you think? All the focus on Brexit and indeed the formation of the of the cabinet around Brexit actually distracted attention uh, from focusing on this terrible virus. Well, I, I I mean just to be completely transparent, I was very opposed to Brexit. Uh, I still am very opposed to Brexit. Um, I think you know it's been refreshing in a way to have not mentioned that word for two or three months uh, in some ways, but nobody should underestimate you know when this epidemic will still be through it uh, we're going to have to come back to the whole issue of brexit so with with that but just putting that on the table as my own views um, I, actually on that one i I wouldn't say that the the brexit issue certainly in conversations I was part of was 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 I never saw that as a reason why uh, Britain didn't act more quickly in January and February. I, I, I don't think you, could, you can blame that on, uh, on, on Brexit issues that, that at least I was ever party to or, or, or heard or listened to, no. No, okay. Joe jo, jo Begbie, question about SARS. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just stick my video on. I, hello. Um, I think just you mentioned a while ago that SARS had not taken hold and become endemic, whereas COVID-19, you think, will um, become endemic in the human population. So I just wondered why the difference. Yeah. So they're, so they're both coronaviruses. So people think of them as very similar. They're, they're actually very, very different. Um, and 
I lived through SARS in in Vietnam and lost a lot of friends uh, who died of SARS uh, uh, in 2002. Um, biologically, uh, when you had SARS, you were very yeah sorry uh, yeah when you when you were infected with SARS and could pass it on to somebody else, you very clearly had symptoms, very really quite severe symptoms. And so as soon as um, the world got its head around SARS and realized that if somebody had those symptoms, you should isolate them and protect yourself, then the transmission chain stopped. The problem we have with COVID-19 is that you're infectious when you're asymptomatic, you're infectious when you've got a very mild cough, and you're infectious, tragically, if three weeks later you may die, you're infectious throughout that period. And that makes it almost impossible to control as an epidemic, and that is the that is the um, that is the that is the mo that's the most important difference between the two. Um, of course, it took six months for the world to realise that for SARS, but nevertheless, it was possible to bring that sort of epidemic to a close, and SARS has not reappeared. Um, it's it's essentially been eradicated, certainly eliminated. Uh, that is not going to happen with COVID nineteen because your asymptomatic transmission, you're infectious for very much longer and you'll pass it on to other people before you even know you're infected. Nikki, I can see, Nikki Bull, I can see a couple of questions from you. Um, can you ask one of them? <laughs> Hi, yes, I was just wondering how likely you think it is that COVID-19 will mutate significantly so that it persists in various places around the world for very many years with vaccines potentially having to be continuously developed? Yeah, it's a real concern. Coronaviruses are made up of RNA. So when you have viruses like RNA, HIV, um, Ebola, uh, influenza indeed, then they change rapidly, they mutate all the time. Uh, so, so far, five months into this epidemic, there, there obviously have been mutations uh, in the uh, RNA but there's not been significant changes in the protein that the virus makes. Uh, and so at the moment, we, we can anticipate there will be further changes, and there's enormous immune pressure on this virus now. Uh, but at the moment, there's not been anything which, is un which would be unexpected or which would make you think that, that, that as of today, this is going to escape a vaccine that was made now. Now, that may change in the future. None of us know that. But... Uh, but at the moment, it's not changing in any unpredictable, un 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 unanticipated uh, way. Um, no. Well, Jeremy, you 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 uh, you very generously give us an hour of your time, um, and we 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 won't keep you further than that. Um, but but thank you so much. You've come along tonight um, at a time of um, immense pressure on your your own life. Um, you're, you're doing extraordinary work, both in funding science generally and in bringing your expertise to bear on, on this crisis. Uh, and you've come along and spoken tremendously openly and frankly tonight. So we're all really grateful for you giving us this time. And maybe there will come a time at some point in the future where you could come in and actually break bread with us or, or have a drink with us or whatever it is. Um, if that if that is ever allowed again, but but thank you for coming along today and um, and uh, good luck. Yeah, thanks very much. And it, it would be nice, Alan, to do that because there are a lot of other topics as you sure. and I discussed in the past, yeah. um, which would be very nice to have a further conversation yeah. on, in, including um, the issues such as divestment. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we, uh, as soon as we can, we'll get yeah. back in touch, and you're, you're just up the road, so that would be wonderful. Yeah. Thank Thanks you so very much, everybody. Thanks very much, Alan, and for everybody to put it together. Thank you.